others just a little while to stay here just a little while to wait just a little while to labor in the path that's always straight there's just a little
Praise the Lord. God bless you. It's good to be with you this evening. And while we're standing, let's take our Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 3. Thank you, musicians. Man, it's so good to gather. Every time we get together, it's a privilege. Amen. May he be the central theme of our gathering. Genesis chapter 3, we're going to read the same portion. We're going to start with the same portion we've been reading. We're back to uh, the series we've been on, Religion versus Relationship, part 4. And the subtitle for this one is Separation. So we want to look at this today. Genesis chapter 3, and let's begin at verse 6. And when, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord's blessing. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, that you by your grace have brought us here again. You've given us strength and health and freedom and liberty and the ability to gather together that we might worship you, Lord. God, we just come now to the, the part of the service where we're asking you, Lord, to break the bread of life, to feed your sheep, Lord. Would you break it with your own hand? Lord, would you, would you make your presence known among us, Lord? And God, we come to you, Lord, because we need you, Lord. We ask that you would come and do what no man can do, that you would feed your sheep, Lord. We come with expectation in our hearts, and we come with a desire to commune with you. And Lord, we receive from you now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can all be seated. And this, it's, it's been uh, just about a week since we've read this portion, and whenever you read it, it's just so amazing that, that the serpent begins to speak to the woman, and the, and the woman, uh, she knows the word, she knows, I, I would say she knows um, the commandment, but she doesn't, she doesn't quite have the revelation of the word, and so because she just knows the commandment, but she doesn't quite have the revelation of the word, the serpent begins to question her. Amen, and begins to adjust the word, and without any true revelation on the word, but just a commandment, the devil's uh, uh, adjustment and flexing of the word is very, very reasonable to her. And that's why, you know, it's so dangerous, amen, just to be, uh, I'd say it this way, it's so dangerous just to be a, a message believer uh, as far as just being part of a message church, if I could say it that way. Just, just to have, be part of a message church, but not have your own individual revelation from God himself, it becomes very dangerous because the devil can come along and take what is true because what Eve had was true, but without the right revelation, he begins to manipulate that truth and bring reasoning and mix reasoning in with the truth. And she's, she's susceptible to that and she falls by that. Amen. And then, and then they find themselves, Adam and his wife find themselves fallen in a fallen condition. And in this fallen condition, they try to cover their nakedness or cover their sin or their shame by reasoning once again. And now they make themselves an apron of fig leaves sewed together so that they might cover their sin. And in covering their sin, uh, um, they're somehow justified in their own eyes. If we could just say it that way, in their own eyes, you know, the fact that they continue to wear the apron is evidence that they feel justified in wearing the apron. If it didn't work, amen, in their own eyes and their own reasoning, when they put the apron on, they're like, ah, oh, that don't work, and they throw it to the side. But the fact that they put it on, left it on, somehow in their reasoning and the carnality of their humanness, amen, they felt like it was okay, it worked, amen, until, amen, the presence of the Lord came into the garden, and he made his presence known by his voice. 
And under that voice, they hid from the presence of God because now, amen, they were naked, but they still had on the apron of fig leaves, which shows that man-made religion will never work in the presence of God. And when the voice of God, amen, comes in the garden, the voice of God, amen, is, is declaring the presence of God, and Adam and his wife were hiding from that presence because in that presence their fig leaves were dissolved. And so this passage of Scripture is, is so sad, but it so sets the stage for the next 6,000 years of humanity. You know, Brother Bram said everything begins in Genesis. He was so absolutely correct, far more so than I had ever imagined before, and probably still more so than I even realized today. Have we seen enough that we can say that's probably every bit the truth, amen? We still probably don't even realize how correct those statements were. Amen. We're just scratching the surface and God is just peeling it back layer by layer. And every time he does, we realize that that prophet knew exactly what he was talking about. You know, so many times the prophet of God, he's teaching the Bible. He's teaching the Bible with somebody who, who knows the author of the Bible. But not somebody who's been educated And educated and knowing the Bible intellectually, he preaches to somebody who knows the one who wrote the Bible. Like the man told Brother Branham, he said, you know, you just don't know your Bible very well. And Brother Branham put up no protest. He did not protest. He said, that may be true. He said, but I know the author really well. And when he knew the author really well, he knew the intent, the meaning, the purpose. He knew what that word was for. Amen. And when Brother Branham's preaching, he's preaching Bible principles. Because he knows the author, amen. He knows what this Bible was written for. He knows the purpose of the word, what the word is trying to accomplish. And now so many people have tried to debate with the message by taking a scripture and a definition and, and this and piecing this together. And, and, and oh my, I, I tell you what, they, they, they're trying to fight against the very revelation of why we have a Bible. Trying to find technical flaws and technicalities on which the prophet may have, may have uh, uh, used the scripture, amen, and quoted it in, in, incorrectly. Did he ever quote scripture incorrectly? Yeah, he said he did. He, he misplaced some of the Bible characters. In different stories, he got some of the numbers wrong. But he knew the author real well. <laughs> And he may have got the wrong number of people, or he may have got the sequence of events out of order, or he may have the wrong Bible character performing the wrong thing, amen, but he was never an error to the truth of the word. He was never an error, amen, to the mind of God on the Bible, to the intent that God had in giving us a word, amen. So now, and just in the, in the last so many years, for me, it's been 20-some years of coming to the message, amen, so many things Brother Branham says because he doesn't always qualify all of his statements. Because he's preaching principles, he doesn't always go to the Bible verse and say, well, I actually got that from these two verses, and when you take these two verses and put them together, well, the phrase that I just said comes from those two truths. And you try to find the Bible that matches the statement. And you try to find the Bible verse that matches the statement, and all of a sudden, uh, you, you can't find, where did he get that? And when you just keep reading, and you just keep reading, and you just keep reading, and all of a sudden, that's where he got that, and that's where he got that. Amen, I didn't realize it was laying in Genesis, and in Revelation, and in the book of John. And You know what, what's happened for me, amen, the, the message is taking away a traditional denominational understanding and it's still stripping it away from me. I thought when I come to the message, I, I left the denominations behind, but the truth is I did. I walked away from the denom denomination, but the effect of being taught that way all my life lingered. And the, and the message is, is still removing the lingering effects. And you find that he knew what he was talking about. 
He was, he was right. What he preached was the truth. What he preached was the word. Amen. He caught the spirit of it. He caught the revelation of it, and he preached that. And you may be able to outquote Bible verses head to head with Brother Branham. But you can, you can repeat the verse accurately and be wrong to the truth that that represents. Or you can quote the scripture inaccurately and be dead on the truth. That's what we've been given this day, the mind of the author. And so we, we thank God that all the way back in Genesis, we see all the way back here in chapter three, we see the problem that we're gonna be dealing with the, for the rest of humanity and the reason that God had to send the prophet in the end time was because of what entered into man through his reasoning right here in Genesis chapter three, that man decided that he was going to make himself his own covering to cover his sin. And that's where religion began. That's where the idea of religion has begun. It began right here at the time of the fall. Amen. And that is going to be the problem that is going to plague and try to cripple and hold back God's elect seed all the way through the Bible. This is the thing that they're going to be fighting with. And this is the reason that God at the end time had to bring a prophet to expose all of this so that we could go free. He says, uh, there, there's a couple quotes that I've been quoting all along. I'm going to just get caught up to speed here. He says, in the beginning when man sinned, it showed the nature of man. He's always trying to hide from God and make himself a way that he can feel justified, a religion. Feel justified, not be justified. Feel justified. That's been a religion means a covering, so he tried to make his own religion. In the message, Satan's Eden, he says, God's Eden was established in righteousness. Satan's Eden is established in sin because Satan is sin. God is righteousness and God's kingdom was established in righteousness and peace and life. And Satan's, Satan's established is in sin and religious sin. So I want you to catch that, that God established his Eden in righteousness and Satan has established his Eden in sin, religious sin. So this Eden that we live in, this Satan's Eden, is established upon religious unbelief. That sounds like an oxymoron, but it's absolutely the truth. It is this, this world that we live in, this Satan's Eden, this culture, everything around us that we're surrounded with is religious unbelief disbelieving the word of God, rejecting the truth of the Bible, but being religious to make a covering to cover all of that sin so that they can feel justified and still be an unbeliever in the word of God. And that's what Satan's Eden is established upon, religious sin. And the God of this evil age, he says, notice Cain, he didn't want no blood sacrifice. He come down and offered the fruit of the fields of beauty upon his altar, very religious, done everything that just exactly like Abel done, offered a sacrifice, fell down before God in worship, obedient in every way, but without the revelation of the word. And the word was from the beginning God's plan, but God revealed by revelation the very thing that he vindicated and punctuated that that was right, not religion, not an altar, not belonging to church, not making a sacrifice, not being sincere, but by the revelation of the Word of God. So everything comes back to revelation of the Word of God. That's what God wanted. That's how God wanted to reveal himself to his people. That's how God wanted to lead his children, by revelation of the Word. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Read a portion here. And then we'll go back to Genesis. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Okay. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Abel didn't figure anything out. It was revealed to him. 
By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. So his ability to offer the right offering by faith witness that he was righteous. It didn't make him righteous. It witnessed that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. Now, see, this is so important. I just want to come back and nail this down. Amen. Abel, by faith, offered a more excellent sacrifice, not by tradition, not by intellect, not by reasoning, not by figuring. He, by faith, he offered a more excellent sacrifice than that of Cain. Amen. By which he witnessed, he witnessed that he was righteous, all right? And so now, when we see that, you could get into a mode where you say, oh, amen, if you offer the right sacrifice, you're righteous, and now you can get into repeating what Abel did and believing that you're righteous because you can do what Abel can do, but you're not righteous because you do what Abel does, you're righteous because you believe the way Abel believes. Because his action witnessed that he was righteous. His action didn't make him righteous. So repeating his action won't make you righteous. Do you understand? This is the problem with religion. Amen. It becomes monkey see, monkey do. And all of a sudden, God, oh, they're godly. I'll do what they do and I'll be what they are. But you can't just copy somebody and be what they are. They are what they are by the election of God. There's a faith that's unlocked in them. And that by faith, amen, they believe God. And it is imputed unto them for righteousness. So this gave witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So how did Enoch please God? By his works? No, by his faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. And he had this testimony that he pleased God. So it means Enoch had faith. See, when we try to please God or get in good graces with God by good conduct, it doesn't mean we should have bad conduct to get in good graces with God. So the, if, I, if I make a statement, it doesn't automatically mean the opposite true, right? So it's not like I'm going to get in. No, we want to do right. We want to serve God. We want to please him. But you cannot please him by works. You can only please him by faith. Amen. And that faith that will move you into an action and the action will testify that you're righteous. But you can't just adapt the action without the faith and be righteous. You cannot please God just by doing all the things that the people who please God do. It's got to be faith. It's got to be a gift of faith that God gives. You have to believe. But without faith, verse 6 again, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was looking for something. He was looking for the city of God, the habitation of God. He was looking for that new Jerusalem. Let's go all the way back to Genesis now. Genesis chapter 6. Let's read through here a little bit. I just want to keep going in the direction we're going right here through the book of Genesis for a little while. Genesis chapter 6, 
And we'll read verse one. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So now we know that God becomes displeased with this, He says in verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. So so God sees that now uh, his elect seed, the sons of God, are are now taking unto them, looking at the daughters of men and recognizing their fair and taking unto them wives. And God did not like this mixing. To this time, God had never interrupted Cain's line and what Cain was doing. He didn't stop him from his scientific achievement. He didn't stop him from his manufacturing. He didn't stop him from his city building. He didn't stop any of that until, amen, that influence started to influence the sons of God. And when that influence began to influence the son of God, bringing a mixing, amen, God come down and he cut the thing off. And he preserved Noah and Noah's three sons and their wives. And he brings them through the ark And he brings them out on the other side of the ark in chapter 9. In chapter 9, verse 1, he said, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So he sends them out. He says, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And he sends them away from the ark, amen, to go, amen, and, and to spread out and to replenish this earth. Then he goes to verse 7, and he repeats it. He says, and you be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. So God's desire was that they would go from the ark, that they would move out, and that they would replenish, that they would multiply abundantly upon the earth and replenish the earth. But you see, man has always got a better way than God's way. And we go to verse, or chapter 11, Genesis chapter 11. Verse 1 says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. Remember what we said? This is the first unifying of church and state. City represents uh, uh, your civil authority, your, your civilization, and the tower represents your religion. And so here we have the first unification of church and state. And then we find this takes place again in Revelation chapter 11, but it starts in Genesis because everything starts in Genesis. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of of the whole earth. So now under Nimrod, because Brother Bam tells us this is under Nimrod's rule, under Nimrod, he begins to become a mighty one upon the earth. He becomes a mighty king. Amen. He establishes his kingdom. And now it's not just one location with a a head of the family and a tribe, but now there's a king who's going forth and conquering and and he's bringing subjects under his dominion and he's establishing multiple cities. If you read of Nimrod back in chapter 10, you see that he's establishing a kingdom through all of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, amen, and this is the first time that we see this in the Bible, and what he's doing is they're bringing them together now, and they want to be unified. Sounds good to be unified. Let's be one. Amen. It depends on how you're one, whether being one is good or bad. Now let's be unified, amen, let's build us a city and a tower, amen, let's bring this civil and ecclesiastical unification together, amen, so that we won't be scattered abroad on the face of the earth, amen, and let's build us this tower unto the heaven so they've got an achievement that they want to achieve. There's something that they're trying to do. They're banding together a religion and they're tying it together with physical force, This becomes forced religion because they have an army and they have people and they have cities and a kingdom. And it said, lest we be scattered abroad, we're going to make a name for ourselves. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And Brother Bram says in the message oneness, he said, a false union brought judgment on the earth 
to Eve and Adam and Eden. And a false union brought the floods of God's judgment on the earth because the daughters of Cain flirted with the sons of God and they fell for it and united together again. There you are, false union, nothing could happen. What did, what did God do? He destroyed the whole thing, all but precious old Noah and his family. They got together. And again after that, after the death of Noah and that spiritual family of Noah, first thing you know, the children of man began to look to one another again. What did they do? Now we're not infidels. We all believe in God. Catch this. They all believe in God. And I just want to tell you, that is one of the most deceptive statements that can be used today. I believe in God. Amen. Cain believed in God. Satan believes in God. Lucifer believed in God. Everybody believes in God. Amen. But, but, but they believed in God. Nimrod believed in God, but Nimrod did not believe God. Nimrod believed in God, but he did not believe God. Amen. Abraham believed God. Amen. Man, he believed in God too, but it wasn't just believing in God. Amen. They both believed in God. Cain and Abel believed in God. Amen. Abraham and Nimrod believed in God. Judas and Peter believed in God. But he did not believe God. Abel believed God. Abraham believed God. And there's a big difference. And you have to ask yourself, what part of God did they believe? They believed the part that was being expressed in their day. That's believing God. Everybody else who believed in the part that was expressed in a previous day believes in God. So I believe in a previous dispensation. Nimrod believed the story of the fall in the garden. Nimrod believed, amen, Noah and his family was saved in the flood. But Nimrod did not believe, amen, that God wanted them to scatter abroad and repopulate the earth, that that was the will of God. And he also did not believe that God would keep his word and not destroy the earth with a flood again, amen. He, he, he believed Amen, that God had preserved Noah. He believed that there was an ark. He believed that eight individuals come through that ark, but he did not believe God because God said, I will not destroy the earth again, and I will put a token in the sky, amen, to show my covenant with man and the earth. I will never destroy the earth again. But he goes about to unify the force of the people and gather the collective force and power of the people so that they can build their own religion and their own protection mechanism to protect themselves in the failure of God because the only way that they would need that tower to escape the flood is if God didn't keep his word and it proved that Nimrod believed in God but he did not believe God I'd venture to say everyone who was gathering in that city and around that tower believed in God and believed in all the stories of Adam and Eve and the flood and Noah. They were all descendants of Noah and his three sons. They're all, they, they all believe it. But when God brings the word for this day, Go forth, multiply, replenish, bring forth abundantly upon the earth. They said, let's not be scattered abroad. And when God said, I made a covenant with you, with everything that breathes upon the earth, and with covenant with the earth, and this sign, this token, the sign of the rainbow in the sky is my token that I will not destroy the earth again, Nimrod did not believe that God would keep his word. So Nimrod was a believing unbeliever. And he had religious sin, religious unbelief. And I would, I would like to just bring to your attention that in the religious unbelief, the works that they were willing to do, the effort that they put into it, 
The beauty, the grandeur, the sacrifice, the commitment, the sincerity, and the dedication far outshined what Abraham did. Just, if you just take it in a carnal, just looking at how much effort, labor, work, expense, material use, number of people involved, sincerity and dedication, amen, what Nimrod was doing in producing the people, amen, with their effort and their sincerity and their beauty and their religious order and their structure and their finance and everything was far outshining what Abraham was able to do because all Abraham was able to do was believe God and move forward. Believe God and move forward. Believe God and move forward. But God declared Abraham righteous and Nimrod and all of them that built the tower were not righteous. So it's not believing in God. It's believing God. And he says, after the death of Noah, we're back in the message oneness again. That spiritual family of Noah, first thing you know, the children of man begin to look to one another again. What did they do? They said, now we're not infidels. We all believe in God. So they got a fellow by a leader, some great archbishop by the name of Nimrod, and they built a tower. They wasn't infidels. They believed there was a heaven. They believed there was a hell. They believed in judgment. But the children of God with the daughters of man again, and they made themselves a union falsely and built a great big cathedral and a great big organization, and all the other places was to babble, was to pay tribute to it. And God hated that thing. He hated that thing. Let's look at chapter 11, verse 5 now. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So too, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So the very works that they were trying to do to protect themselves from being scattered abroad, God come down in a judgment and condemned that thing and he confused their languages and scattered them. He scattered them abroad upon the face of the earth, showing that what God wanted, God wanted the people to be scattered, not unified. I hope you understand what I'm saying. God, he still doesn't want this false union. He still doesn't want man to unify himself. God still does not want man to unify himself. He doesn't want us to make unions. He doesn't want us to, the, the, to unionize ourselves, to gather ourselves together by our own means and by our own understanding and by our own efforts. That's not God's kind of oneness. That's not the oneness he's looking for. That'll bring another false union, but God doesn't want that kind of oneness. He doesn't want that kind of unity. Does God want unity? Yes, but he wants a unity of faith. Not, not even necessarily does he need a, a unity of action. He needs a unity of faith. And a unity of faith is true unity. You don't have to be in the same location. You don't have to know one another. See, God wanted them scattered abroad. He scattered them abroad because he wanted to be a father to them. Amen. And he wanted them to do as Seth and his children when they were scattered abroad. And when they would seek the name of the Lord, they were calling upon the name of the Lord. And he could begin to deal with them as individuals because God was not going to deal, amen, in the group. He wanted to deal with the individual. And this false unity, amen, this false unity protected, I hope you catch this, this false unity protected the individual from God speaking to him directly. This is the devil's attempt that now 
You did not need an individual interaction with God anymore. What did you need? You needed a priesthood, and you needed a high priest, and you needed a mighty king, and you needed an anointed man, and you needed a gifted this, and you needed an established that. And then the individual would no longer be calling on the name of the Lord. They would be part of the religious order of the day. And as part of the religious order, it would become a covering so that they would feel justified like everything's all right. And they would allow God to speak to the head. And the head would come and tell all the subjects. And what, what this whole religion was trying to do was to create a barrier from individual revelation, a barrier from individual communing with God, a barrier to an individual seeking God alone. And that is still the objective of religion today. That's why some people, they'll, they'll, they'll say they believe the message, they're in the message, and they never touch a tape, never touch a book, amen, because they're sitting under the anointed man who reads the messages, who comes and preaches, and I just get it from my pastor, amen. It's the same system, friends. But the message came to abolish that thinking, to demolish it, to break it down and scatter us abroad away from the denominations so that we would each go back to calling on the name of the Lord. Instead of God sent me the word, I need to eat the word, amen. This is my bread I got from God himself, amen. I'm going to eat what my father has given me. Amen. I'm not going to ask somebody else to take their portion and cook me a piece. But, but now God has scattered us out of the denominations. Not so that we could bind ourselves back together under religion, and that there would be a new barrier to individual communion with God. That wasn't the point of the message. The point of the message was to break the tower. The point of the message was to destroy, amen, the Roman system of worship, amen, which started the Catholic Church, which started every other Protestant church that came out of the mother, turned back and became the same thing, a prostitute off the mother whore. And he came to break that walled city, to break that tower. Not so that we would just go out to bind ourselves back together, and to build the system over again. Praise God. The Word of God exposes everything. How was it that Nimrod was able to get so many people unified? How? How was he able to get so many people unified under such effort and and, and such sacrifice and such labor and, and, and all of this. And I'll tell you, it's because the fallen nature of man desperately, desperately, desperately wants a covering. He does not want to face God alone. The fallen nature of man does not want to stand before that holy fire does not want to come to the judgment of the revealed word. He wants to hide behind another religion, and he'll, he'll put in great amounts of money, extreme amounts of effort. He will actually uh, allow a ministry or a church or an organization to punish him spiritually. You seen it? Just so they don't have to face God alone as an individual. It all started in Genesis. And God scattered them abroad upon the face of the earth because that's what he wanted so he could deal with the individuals. And when he scattered them, there was really one individual he was looking for. And that one individual was caught up in that thing. And that one individual was Abraham. He broke that whole system so that he could get Abraham separated to himself. Because Abraham was his elect seed. And the prophet of God has come down this day and broke that whole system of Nimrod again because he wants to get one all by himself and that one is the seed of Abraham. 
And if you're seed of Abraham, you're that one that that prophet came and God himself came down through that prophet and broke that system again so he could get to you. Amen. You're the one that he wants. Amen. Brother Bram says in Jehovah Jireh, he says, now God called Abraham not because he was Abraham. God called Abraham by election. Abraham was no, was no good man, no better than anybody else. This is doing me a world of good. He probably come out of the group of idolaters down from the Tower of Babel where they worship roots and the ground and they had a woman up there and she had all kinds of curious arts she practiced. If you ever read the history and there's where the first organized church ever began was in Babylon by Nimrod, organized all the cities and they paid tribute and so forth to the one place. Now Abraham's father brought him down from Babylon and they dwelt in the city of Ur and the land of Chaldea and Abraham was just an ordinary man like you and I, just an ordinary man. But God, oh, I want you to get it. God, by foreknowledge, called him and elected Abraham. He knew his heart. He knew him before the foundation of the world. And Abraham only fit into God's program. Again in Jehovah Jireh, he says, notice, uh, Abraham was no different from no one else. He was just an ordinary man. He come down with his father, after the scattering of Babylon. Catch this. He come down with his father after the scattering of Babylon, come down in the valley of Shinar, dwelt in the city of Ur in the land of Chaldea, just an ordinary man and an old man. Why God called him? He was 75 years old. Then he says in 1964, in the message Jehovah Jireh, he says, now Abraham we find out, don't appear until we find him here about the 12th chapter, the 11th chapter of Genesis, we find that his father come down from Babylon. And Abraham was just an ordinary man, just as you or I or anyone else. I just want you to see that the prophet is showing us that Abraham's father was tied up in this system. And when that system broke up, Terah, his father, brought him down. He may have been a, a young boy. I don't know how old he was. Amen. But brought him down into Ur, and they were in Ur, the Chaldees, and, and, and God, amen, began to call Abraham, begin to deal with Abraham. But you see that God broke this whole system up to free his elect from that so that he could get directly to his elect. And God has broke the Roman system of denominations so that he can get direct to the seed of Abraham in this day. But oh, wouldn't Satan love to build another system? Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12, and I'll begin at verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house and to a land that I will show thee. So he said, the Lord had said unto him, speaking past tense, because if you read the verse before, in verse 32 of chapter 11, he says, in the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So Terah, at the breaking up of Babylon, Terah, his dad, had brought him down to Ur of the Chaldees, and they lived there. And God, Brother Bram tells us, God called Abraham in Ur, amen, and, and Terah wants to take his family to Canaan, so on the way to Canaan, they move up through Mesopotamia to the north of Mesopotamia, and when they get to the top, they stop at Haran. And at Haran is where Terah dies. And when Terah dies, the next scripture says, now the Lord had said unto Abraham, to Abram. So he's speaking past tense. God had already told this to Abram, but Abram hadn't fully obeyed yet. The Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him. Uh-oh. That's not exactly what the Lord said. And Lot went with him, and Abram was 70 and five years old, and he departed out of Haran, and he was going to Canaan land. So, so we say, 
in the message forsaking all, the prophet of God says, but the first thing he had to do is separate himself. He separated himself from his people, all of his loved ones, the old associates that he used to run around with, his boyhood friends that come down from Babylon with him and all his brothers, sisters, and all of his friends that he knew, his associates. When God called him, he said, separate yourself from your kindred. Get away from it all. Now, that was hard, but he separated himself from all his kinfolks. See, God broke up that system so that he could get Abraham alone. But Abram was so accustomed to the comfort of unification. You understand, man still wants, you know, man still wants a group. It's true. Just look inside, you'll find that it's right there in you. Man still finds comfort from being surrounded by godly people that I know. And like, like if I know God's working a miracle for them and them and them, then, then we're okay. Man still wants a group. He still, man still wants the security that comes from a group. And Abram was no different. He wasn't declaring, he was elect of God. But he, Brother Ben said he was just an ordinary man. He wasn't anything special. He was just an ordinary man. But he was elect, foreordained, chosen of God. And when God broke up that system to get Abram free, when Abram started to go, amen, I, I don't know what conversation he had with his dad or whatever, but down in Ur he was called. But his dad decided we're all going to go to Canaan land. And so his dad takes him and they go on up to Haran and they park in Haran until Terah dies. And when Terah dies, the scripture says, God had said to Abram. So now, there's another opportunity for a greater separation. And you know, Terah passing away and dying, amen, may have been a loss of a great comfort to Abram. It may have been sad, discouraging, disappointing, whatever. Abraham may not have wanted to take the journey out of Mesopotamia, around the Fertile Crescent, and all the way over into, into Canaan land all by himself. He may have had great comfort in his dad leading the way, amen, but God wanted Abraham alone, and he was going to make sure that he didn't cross from Haran over into Canaan land, amen. He, he allowed Terah to die. And you sometimes wonder, why is all this happening to me? Why did this church break up? And why did that preacher go off the scene? And why did this happen? And why did this person fall away? And the person that led me to the message, now they don't believe it anymore. And the, what's happening? God wants just you, amen? Just you, all by yourself. That's what he wants. He wants to scatter us abroad. That doesn't mean we don't come to a church. That doesn't mean we want to fellowship. But God doesn't want us to link ourselves together in some religious security that comes from a group. He wants our security to come from our relationship with him. Because he's revealed himself to us. He's given us his word. We have faith, amen, by a revelation of what he's told us. We know what the word is for our day, and we know that we're connected to him as an individual. And if we as his elect are having a little bit of trouble with separation, then God knows how to bring separation. See, the... The message has come to reveal, to break the seals off of our lives. And so we can see what God has been doing, not just through the church ages, but through my age, from the time I was a little boy. In the message, God's covenant with Abraham and his seed, he says, now notice, when God called Abraham, he called for total separation. Separate yourself from your kinsmen. Separate from your father's house. Separate from all your associates and completely annihilate yourself from all these things and walk with me. What a privilege it is when a man is being called like that. How happy a real Christian is to separate himself. Amen. Separate yourself. Let's turn. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter six and verse 14. Be 
not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So God's word calls for total separation from unbelief. God wants us separated. In the message Redeemer, Redemption from 55, he says, notice, when I remember the time when I got saved, I remember the time when the angel of the Lord come and told me, go pray for sick people. And a great friend of mine in the denomination I belong to said, Billy, you're going to be a holy roller, as sure as the world. My mother said, why, Billy, you've lost your mind. My poor old dad that died in my arms said, Billy, you can't bring that stuff around this house here. They thought I was crazy. The people, I was a single man. My girlfriends that I'd been going with thought I was crazy. But I know something happened. I know that I could trust him. No matter what taken place, I believed him. And you have to believe him. Sometimes he calls a total separation from friends and associates. But separate yourself from the things of the world and talk with God. Man, I'd like for you to turn to the book of Exodus with me. Exodus 34. I just want to keep working this principle of separation. See it in the word. Exodus 34 and verse 10. And he said, behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves, for they, they shalt worship no other God. Thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. He hasn't changed his nature. If he was a jealous God then, he's a jealous God now. For God whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods and one called thee and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make no molten image. So God is telling them, now I'm bringing you in an exodus, and I'm bringing you out into this land. And when you go into this land, I do not, I'm going to drive out all the inhabitants of the land. That was the promise God made them. I will drive out all the inhabitants of the land. And he says, do not come into any agreement with them. Make no peace agreement. I'm going to drive out all the inhabitants of the land and don't make a peace agreement for these reasons because if you do, they'll become a snare to you. In another place, and he says, they'll become a snare in your eye and a, a, and a prick in your flesh. Because God wanted a total separation. God had already given these people their chance, amen? They already had a chance in Canaan land. They already had a ministry of Abraham that had moved up and down and back and forth, amen? They had already seen an elect seed of God, and they still continued to go on in their way. And now the, 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 the iniquity of the Malachites was full, and God was now coming down in judgment to purge them out of his land. This is his land. And he's purging them out of his land. And he he tells the Israelites, I will drive them out, but you're going to go in and fight. Amen. God's going to come in here in partnership with Israel. He's promised to drive them out, but you have to fight the battles. And we want to totally separate from all unbelief. Pull down their groves. Destroy their idols. Burn the images. And he says, totally get rid of all unbelief. But we know that they never did. 
And the very thing that they refused to separate from because it required effort, it required faith in God, it required perseverance, it required all of these things to trust God and keep at his word until God fulfilled his word. But because they let down on God's word, amen, they never fully conquered and they never fully drove out all the unbelief. And the thing that remained was the very thing that became a trap to them and brought them down. God wanted total separation. Why did God want total separation? Because he's a jealous God. Let's go to Numbers 33. Just going to read a couple quick places, a couple more scriptures, but Numbers 33. I want you to see this has always, always been God's plan. Numbers 33 and verse 50. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures, and destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places. He, did he use the word all? All, all, all. And you shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. Now let's go over to Judges chapter 2. Just two books over. Joshua, Joshua then Judges. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum, and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt, and I brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Now that it comes and they get a report from the Lord that you haven't done what I told you to do. Because God, when God, when God broke up Babylon, and he laid Babylon, or Babel, ruin, amen, and confounded their language and scattered them abroad. He did that so that he could get Abraham to himself. But then when God come down to redeem the nation of Israel out of Egypt, amen, he destroyed Egypt, and he did many signs, amen, and he brought a great destruction in Egypt, but he did that because he wanted the people to himself. He's pulling a nation out of a nation, amen? And, and he wanted to bring them out into the wilderness. And out in the wilderness, he wanted to cleanse them with his word. Amen. He wanted to purge them, amen, from their captivity. And he wanted to wash away, amen, all the captivity of Egypt. And he wanted to bring them out. And he wanted to actually purge them and purify them in the wilderness. And he wanted to bring them into Beulah land, the marriage land. He wanted to marry them and bring them to the land and drive out all the inhabitants and get rid of all the dis uh, unbelief. And he wanted to be with them. And he wanted to be in union with them. That was God's desire. What he wanted with Adam and Eve, amen, what he wanted with Abraham, what he wanted with the nation of Israel, he always wanted the same thing. He's a jealous God, and he wanted his elect to himself. That's God's desire. That's always been God's desire. He wants his elect to himself. You say, jealous. Jeal is jealous good or is jealous bad? We, we, we look at jealous as being bad, but in this context, I look at jealous as being good because he's jealous about me. Like, I think this jealousy is beautiful. I think it's wonderful. He's jealous over me. He's so jealous, he won't let me go wrong. He's so jealous over Abraham, he'll bring separation. Amen? He's so jealous over Abraham that if, if, if Abraham is still comforted under the headship of his father, he'll allow his father to die. What is that? God's jealousy over his elect. Amen. So jealous over Abraham, if he still just cannot part ways with Lot, he'll allow a dispute to come up between the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham. And under contention and under a very negative atmosphere, amen, they'll part ways and separate. Amen. Yeah. What is that? That's the jealous love of God. 
And he's so jealous over you. Amen. When you start to have affections that turn away, amen, God knows how to come down and rake that thing away from you because he jealously loves you. I like that kind of jealousy. The Genesis, let's go back to Genesis 13. Genesis 13 and verse 5. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold, and he went out on his journeys from the south even to Bethel and to the place where, he, where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. Uh, This is so beautiful. God is now using blessing to create division. Abraham goes down into Egypt, and he goes down into Egypt, and and he gets nervous because his wife is fair to look upon, and as he gets nervous, he thinks that they might try to kill him, to take her if they know that these are husbands because they believed in marriage and divorce in those days. And so they knew that he had to die. Abraham died if they were going to marry his wife. So they go down. And he says, now tell them you're my sister. And so we know the story. And, and finally it comes out. Amen. And Pharaoh questions him and says, why did you do this to us? And why did you say? And, and it says that, that, that Pharaoh made Abraham very rich in cattle and gold and in silver and in men servants and maid servants. So all of a sudden, uh, uh, Abraham goes down there and he's not even supposed to leave the land. God brought him to this land. But because there was a famine, he left the land. Abraham is in error. But God is trying to shake off Lot. Now do you understand your misunderstood life? Abraham's doing something that he shouldn't do because God never told him to, he couldn't go to the land, he never told him to leave the land. And he's going down and now he, he tells his wife to tell a lie and they bring a deception. And God brings it out, and he doesn't doesn't, uh, seemingly punish Abraham. Abraham leaves Egypt, and he spoiled Pharaoh. Because he's laying a foundation for what has to come later, because the seed of Abraham will come down. The seed of Abraham will come unto Egypt, and when they leave Egypt, they have to go with a great spoil. So now that Abraham's here, because there's a revolving history to prophecy... So Abraham is now just foreshadowing what will happen later. He comes in, and his very presence becomes a curse to Pharaoh and his household. Now Pharaoh has to push Abraham out. What is this? This is all going to come with Abraham's descendants. The Bible's perfect, friends. And so now he pushes him out, but when he pushes him out, he, he spoils Pharaoh, and he spoils Egypt, and he leaves with great wealth, and so does Lot. And they leave so rich and so laden down with goods when they go back into the land where they were before that now the land cannot support both of them. And what is God doing? God is using blessings to bring separation. Praise God. He knows exactly how to get his elect seed to himself. And now they're both doing so well that the land cannot support them. Amen. So, so now Abraham has a proposition. Let's see, where, I'm, where am I at now? Uh, 13. Verse 5. And Lot also which went with, it, with Abraham had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. How did it get great? Because he went to Egypt when he wasn't supposed to go to Egypt. 
And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt in the land, in that, it dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. It's not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou depart to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. It was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now, lift up now, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. Where did he get him to? Amen. Even Lot and his carnality went down to the well-watered Jordan because it was fertile, it was fruitful. He could be, have progress and he could prosper there. And even he moved down there, which would force Abraham to go the other way. And where did God get Abraham? He got him smack dab in the middle of the promised land. And he got him in the middle of the promised land, which was not the better piece of land like the plains of Jordan, but it was the exact predestinated spot where he needed to be when he finally come into full separation. He's standing in the middle of the land. He said, now lift up your eyes. Look northward, look southward, look to the east and look to the west. Why? He's standing in the middle of the promised land because God is perfect and God is jealous and God always wanted to get Abraham by himself to this place so that he could give him the promise. And all the wonderings and movings and shiftings and right and wrong and in and out and all of it is because God has got to get Abraham, his elect predestinated seed, in his program to his spot, amen, so that he can reveal to him all this word is yours. Amen. From Genesis to Revelation in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's all yours, amen. I've separated you from denominations. You've had so much strife and trouble and, and so many things that have happened in your life, but I'm trying to break the Babylonian system. I'm trying, amen, I'm trying to break it down where they don't understand your language anymore. You don't understand your language anymore. You're not even speaking the same thing anymore. And even the ones that would come out with you originally... God would allow them to fade off the scene or he would bring a contention where they would have to go one way and you would have to go the other way. Because God is bringing separation because separation is bringing relationship. Why the separation? Listen, it's not separation because this one's bad and this one's good and blah, blah. It has nothing to do with it. The separation is all about God being a jealous God and he wants a relationship with just you. Amen. And he's so jealous, he doesn't want you comforted by this one or that one or, or this church or that system or this. If any of those comforts are coming between his jealous love for you, amen, if it's dividing your focus, if it's, if it's causing you to have affection somewhere else or comfort or, or, or confidence in something else, God will see to it that that thing gets broke somehow and separated off because he's a jealous God with a jealous love and he wants you and just you. And somehow through it all, he'll bring you right back to the middle of the promised land. And when you get all by yourself, I'm wondering how did I get to this place in my life? You say, now lift up thine eyes and look from Genesis to Revelation, from before the foundation of the world to the new heavens and new earth. It's all yours, I've given it all to you. <laughs> Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God. Read that again in verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram after that lot was separated from him. That was the last separation. 
Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed, after, seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. This is God's jealous love. Brother Bram says in Jehovah Jireh, he says, now total separation from all unbelief. And remember, Abraham the patriarch was never absolutely fully blessed until he obeyed exactly what God said do. And we'll never, never be blessed any and have the blessings until we obey what God said do. I want to just take a, if I could just take about five minutes and I want to compare and contrast Nimrod and Abraham. Nimrod, under Nimrod's ministry and with Nimrod's idea, Nimrod gathered the people. But under Abraham's dispensation, Abraham kept separating from the people. Nimrod formed a system for worship. Abraham had no system for worship. He built an altar, he worshiped God, and he left. He didn't start a church. Sometimes he'd come back to that altar and offer again, then he would be off to someplace else and build another altar. He was just moving with God, worshiping as he moved. Nimrod had a system, Abraham had no system. Nimrod tried to produce a mechanism to protect himself. What was he protecting himself from? He was trying to protect himself from the judgments of God. But in doing so, he proved his disbelief in God's word. And his protective mechanism was trying to produce the promise because the promise was, I will not destroy you with the flood again. So his efforts is trying to produce a mechanism that will protect him and produce the word of God. Only he wanted to do it because he didn't trust God to do it. Abraham failed by trying to protect himself. Abraham tried to protect himself and it failed. He tried to say, amen, they'll kill me. You, you, you tell them, you're... he tried to protect himself and he tried to produce the promise and it failed. God would never let it work out. <laughs> he tried to protect himself, he failed. He tried to produce the promise, it failed. God was the one who protected Abraham, and then God was the one who produced the promise without any help from Abraham. Nimrod put a great deal of effort and money and finances and, and all of his intellect and wisdom into trying to produce the word. Abraham could not do anything to produce the word. Abraham did not put in effort. He did not put in money. He did not have to use stamina, energy. All he had to do was believe God. And when he believed God, and he, how did he believe God? This is so key. How did he believe God? He recognized him when he came in his day in another form. He recognized that was Elohim there that was eating flesh, drinking milk. He had his feet washed. That was Elohim. He recognized God in his present day expression. Proving that he believed God. And all he had to do was believe God. And when he believed God, God now performed the promise without any help from Abraham. Abraham couldn't change his body, couldn't change Sarah's body. God did that on his own, in due season, in fit time. God did it with no help from Abraham. Praise God. Nimrod believed in God, but did not believe God. Abraham believed in God, 
and believed God. And because of that, he was justified. Because Nimrod believed in God but didn't believe God, he was condemned. Because Abraham believed God, he was justified. <clears throat> Nimrod was the enemy of God. And Abraham was called the friend of God. These are two drastically different characters in the Bible. And God is showing man versus his elect seed. The false and the true vine on display again. Let's turn to the book of James. I just want to read a couple more verses here out of the Bible as we wrap up. James 2. James chapter 2. In verse 23. James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. See, God was separating for relationship. God was jealous over his love of his elect, and it was God, not anyone else, it was God who called Abraham his friend. Let's pick that up in Isaiah so you can read it in your Bible, Isaiah 41. This is not the only place that says, says it, but it's here in Isaiah. Isaiah 41, and God is speaking through Isaiah. And let's just read one verse, Isaiah 41 and verse 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Boy, all that Abraham went through in his wanderings and his separations and all that, I think it's worth it to be called his friend. I think that shows what God wanted. God wanted Abraham as his friend. He wanted a relationship with Abraham. So God required separation for the purpose of relationship. And God in this day is calling for separation for the purpose of relationship. Let's go back to James. Go back to where we were in James. James chapter 4. All right, James chapter 4 and verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Do you want to be God's friend? Or do you want to be an enmity with God? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. For whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. This is why God's word calls for total separation from unbelief. Because if you'll be a friend of the world, you'll be an enemy to God. But God doesn't want you to be his enemy. God wants you to separate from the world and the things of the world because he wants a relationship. Amen. Go over to 1 John, just a couple books over, 1 John chapter 2. In verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and all the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now let's go back to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. John 15, and verse 12. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And ye are my friends. 
Now Jesus Christ has called his disciples and he separated them out and he's drawn them to himself. And now he calls them friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. The friendship brought the revelation. He said, I don't call you a servant because I'm telling you everything the Father gave me, now I'm sharing with you. That makes you my friend. The revelation of the word brings a greater intimacy. The revelation from the Father that Christ brings to his bride brings a greater intimacy. He goes, I can't call you servants anymore because all things that my Father showed me, I have showed you. So now I have to call you friends. This is why God wants to separate us, is because he wants to reveal himself to us, because he wants to have a relationship with us. But the the devil is trying to recreate systems all around us so that we gain comfort in the group, comfort in the strong man, comfort in the, uh, the, the spiritual intercessor. That's not Christ, but another system or another man or another form of religion because he's trying to break this unity with God and man. And God is jealous over this relationship. He goes on to say, verse 16, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You cannot choose to become God's friend. God has already chosen to be yours. Abraham couldn't choose to have this jealous love of God, watch over him and follow him and separate him out so that he can bring a revelation of the promised inheritance. It was God who chose Abraham. These disciples didn't choose Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ chose these disciples. And he ordained them. And he told them all that the Father showed him. So now he's changing the relationship from servant because there's a greater intimacy that comes with separation, and now you're friend. So you can go from servant to friend, but in this day, he wants to go from friend to bride. If it's gonna require election, and choosing, calling, separating, and revealing to make a friend, what's it gonna to take to make a bride? A total separation from all unbelief. Brother Benham says in the message, Shalom, he says, God is a jealous God. He is jealous and he wants his wife pure. He wants her virgin, chaste, nothing in the world into her at all. Altogether, his word, part of him. We must be part of the word, not part of the creed, part of the word, not part of the church, part of the, a part of the bride. Church is condemned. We know that she goes to outer darkness, but the bride goes up. In the message, God's word calls for total separation from unbelief in 1964. He said, Paul was a Nazarite unto the Lord. He was separated from his Orthodox church to the word word of the living God. Aaron was a Nazarite unto the Lord. He was separated from among the brethren to bear the birth stones and to be the high priest. It is a total separation. We're not to go back into the world no more or have anything to do with the world, but cleave only unto God. Jesus is coming for a bride, a woman, a church that's separated from the things of the world or the cares of the world. She is separated from the fashions of this modern age that we live in. She is separated from the cares of the traditions of the churches. She is separated only to God, and God is the Word. And as husband and wife is one, so does the bride and the Word become one, for the Word is living through the bride. That's how. That's her credentials. That's her identification. In the message, Scriptural Signs of the Times from 64, he says, but remember, the bride will be called out, separated, and different, filled, Holy Ghost born, washed in the blood of the Lamb. She'll abstain from everything that's filthy around her husband. She is a chaste virgin, pure by the word. The word and her are the same. As a man and his wife become one in union, so does the real, genuine church of God. See, God is a jealous God, and he wants a pure virgin, unadulterated, clean wife. 
And so what has he got to do to have that kind of a wife? He's got to bring a separation and he's got to separate her from all the traditions and creeds and doctrines of denominational systems. He's got to break Babylon again. And he's got to separate her out. And he's got to keep separating her. She may try to come out of the denominations, but bring a few of those ideas along, and he cuts it away. Keep a few of those relationships away, along, and he cuts them away. And he cuts away, and he cuts away, and he cuts away, until he gets just her and her alone. Until then, he pours his water over her, and he begins to wash her with the water of the word to make her so he can present to himself a spotless bride without blemish or any such thing. Abraham couldn't produce anything. The bride can't produce anything, but he is separating her to himself. He is washing her with the word. He says, if you won't stay under the water of this word, how are you going to be washed from the spotted spots of these prostitutes? It's not anything that we can do to ourselves. The only thing we can do is submit and surrender as he cuts away, let it go. As he separates, let it go. As he washes with the word and the word begins to wash away ideas, let him go. As the word begins to wash away habits, let him go. As the word begins to wash away, amen, old things that used to hang on in your, in your mind, old habits, old ways of thinking, let him go and surrender to the one that's purifying you by his word. Why, what is this? This is his jealous love so that he can present to himself a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And now he's drawing her up close to his side because he's cutting things off of her. He's washing her with the word to present himself a virgin bride and he draws her up close to him and he whispers love secrets in her ear. He spoke in parables to the multitudes, but behind closed doors with his disciples, he made them friends by revealing to them what the parables meant. And now he's brought the bride separated from denominations, separated from ideas of man, and brought her to himself and to the land. And now he's whispering the secrets behind the secrets. Why? Because he's making her his lovely bride by separation and revelation. The relationship is getting more intimate and more intimate and more intimate. Not servants, from servants to friends. Now not friends, from friends to bride. This is what God wants. And this is what we want. Let's finish with two verses out of Revelation. Revelation 18 and verse 4. Revelation 18, 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and you receive not of her plagues. Go to Revelation 19. Verse 5, and a voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God, all his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. God has sent a word to wash his bride. He has sent a word to clothe his bride so that she will be clothed in his very own righteousness. The bride has made herself ready. How? What did she do? She just wore the garments. She just took what, a, what God gave through a prophet and she just put it on and she didn't add to it and she didn't take from it. She let the word wash her and she let the word clothe her and she has made herself ready. 
because that's what this jealous God has wanted. Amen, let's stand. Musicians, if you'd come, Brother Blake, if you'd come. The bride is separated from everything that is not the word. That's the work that he's doing today. He wants to separate the bride. What does he want to separate me from? Everything that's not the word he wants to separate you from because this has to be a word bride. She is washed by the word, purified by the word, clothed in the word. She is becoming the manifestation of the word. The word is flowing through her. She is be. She is becoming one with the word. She is becoming the word. Praise God. The separation is bringing a deeper intimacy and bringing a relationship. And Satan would love to convince God's children to go back into a system. He said, Brother Chad, I would never go back to the Pentecostal church, Baptist church, Catholic church. You don't have to go anywhere else to be in a system. If you bring the systematic thinking into your heart and your mind and you begin to worship in the seat you're sitting in now at, like you worshiped in that system, amen, you are under the system. You are still under the Roman system. And don't think that the devil is trying to fight Baptists and he's trying to fight Methodists. And he, he is trying to disrupt the bride. He is trying to keep you from the washing of the water of the word. He's trying to keep you from being the virgin spotless bride that you're called to be in this hour. And he's trying to keep you from wearing that garment. Because when the bride has made herself ready, there's a cry and a shout and thunderings that goes off in heaven and said, hallelujah, praise to our God for the marriage of the bride has come and the bride has made herself ready. All of heaven is waiting for this, friends. And there's a battle going on all around the bride. Satan is trying to stop that from happening. And God is slowly moving and molding and washing and purging and getting the bride into this condition. And she's surrendering and yielding and feeding on the word and putting it on her. And the devil is trying to bring another barrier to block the intimacy with God. If he can get you to think group, he's got you. If he can get you to rely on a preacher, he's got you. If he can get you to trust in your church, he's got you. But when God and his jealous love comes to you and just you, and you know he's talking to you and just you, and you know he loves you and you know you love him and you know you've met a living God and you're in contact with God, amen, then everything else becomes secondary. That becomes the only thing and that's what God wants. That's why he brings separation, not so that we can be another sect of another holiness movement. That's not the purpose for separation. The separation is not to become, I mean, now we're the correct pilgrim holiness because they fell. Another Amish, another Mennonite, another Wesleyan. That's not separation. It wasn't separation for that reason, not to start a new movement or a new code of conduct or new rules. He separated you to himself so that he can have an intimate relationship with you, so he can whisper the love secrets in your ears so that you'll realize you're the bride. And the devil is trying everything to stop that level of intimacy. But praise God. He can't win. Amen. Tried to trip up Abraham, got him in Babylon. God broke the whole system up to get him out. Got him to take his dad along, his dad died. Got him to take Lot along, well, we'll just prosper him so much that they can't even live together anymore. What is this? The jealous love of God. Separating, 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 separating until now he's standing in the middle of the land all by himself, just him and God. And God says, now look to the north, to the south. When God gets you right smack dab in the middle of his promise for this day, just you and him, and he says, it's all yours. 
You're a joint heir with me. All that I've inherited, you've inherited too. Look from before the foundation in the mind of God. Look to the new heavens and new earth. Look to Genesis. Look to Revelation. It's all yours. You're a joint heir. Praise be to God. This is why we love separation. Because it brings us into relationship. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your word, for it means so much to us, Lord. God, we recognize your jealous love for us. Your correction, Lord, it comes to us to correct our wrong thinking and our wrong actions, not punishments, not retribution, Lord, but it's your great desire to have us to yourself. You've disrupted our families. You've disrupted our friendships. You've disrupted churches. You've broke systems and you've broke groups and you, you've broke long-term friendships. You've caused family strife and work problems. and You've done all of it because you love us. You've not done it in punishment. You've done, done it uh, in retribution. You've done it. Your great jealous love has moved you into these actions to bring us where we finally get to the place where it's just you and us. And you can show us the promise. Oh God, I pray that you'd bring that reality to your children tonight. Oh, that we would come to a greater understanding, a greater reality, a greater intimacy as you reveal the word to us more and more. Wash us in that word. Help us to be clothed in that word. That by your grace, Lord, and by your Holy Ghost, this bride will make herself ready. And all of heaven will rejoice and bring glad tidings. Oh, God, how we love you and how we thank you for what you're doing. We have no strength or ability to produce the promise. But you promised you would do it if we just trust you. If we can just believe you, believe your word, surrender to it, trust it. And let it accomplish all that you sent it forth to accomplish. God, be with us, Lord. If there's anything in our lives that needs stripped away, reveal it to us now. If there's anything, Lord, that you want us to separate from, Lord, please, Lord, bring it to our attention and we will surrender it to you, Lord. Strip it all away so well, this bride is just a word bride. It's just a word only. Oh, thank you for whispering love secrets in our ears because you don't whisper the love secrets to those who aren't your sweetheart. But you reserve that just for your sweetheart. God, you're identifying us by sharing your love secrets with us. God, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you that you loved us first so that now we can love you. We pray, God, that you would just be in us, that you would abide in us, that you would have preeminence among us that you would accomplish all that you desire to accomplish in this day through us as we surrender to you. We ask that you go with us as we leave here. Bless us in our work tomorrow and all the activities we do in our travels. God, just let your light shine through us and let us walk right, right in the path that you predestinate us for us to walk in. Let us be you expressed through us in this world. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Bless you, baby. Well, it's Jesus I really want to see. It's Jesus.
of this old world bless it means to me for it's Jesus that I Oh
Hey.